Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. In this video, we are going to talk about the net flow of a vector field along a curve sitting in three-dimensional space. So you can imagine a curve sitting in 3D, and uh, imagine that sitting inside of a three-dimensional vector field, and you're going to find the net flow of that vector field along this curve. It might be open, it might be closed, it depends on the, the particular problem, um, and we will have a really nice theorem for dealing with these problems. It's kind of the capstone theorem of this course. It's called Stokes' theorem, and it's typically the capstone theorem of pretty much any vector calculus course. Um, so kind of exciting. This is uh, this is the big final theorem of the class. Um, now, if you want to start talking about uh, flow along in three-dimensional space, it probably makes sense to go back in time just a little bit and uh, think about how we did flow across in three-dimensional space, which is what we just finished up in our Lesson 12 chapter. And uh, the way we did that is we went back in time to Lesson 8, and we said, oh, you know, we've done this before, just in two-dimensional space. So in Lesson 8, we talked about how to do the net flow of a vector field across a closed curve or an open curve. We did both, right? Um, and we had a couple tools. We had path integrals, Right? We could do the integral of field dot normal. And then we had this really powerful Gauss Green theorem in two-dimensional two space that allowed us to basically have some choices, at least if we had a closed curve and no singularities inside of the curve. We also got to do the double integral of the divergence. So we had options. Path integral of field dot uh, normal, or we could do the double integral of the divergence. And we had, you know, this convenient definition of what the divergence was, dm dx plus dm dy. Now we wanted to take this Lesson 8 material that was stuck in two-dimensional space, we wanted to lift it up to three-dimensional space, and it turned out to not be that difficult. Um, the Gauss-Green theorem turned into the divergence theorem. Instead of a uh, path integral equals a double integral, we had a surface integral equals a triple integral. So not that big of a deal there. And then we did have to update our definition of the divergence. Um, we have a three-dimensional vector field now. Um, we have three uh, coordinate axes, x, y, and z. And so we had to update our divergence definition to add one more term, dp, dz, right there. Um, but everything kind of fits perfectly. It lifts up really nicely from two-dimensional space up into three-dimensional space, and that was basically the work of Lesson 12, was making all of this machinery work for three-dimensional space. Um, we want to do the same exact thing here in Lesson 13 as we transition to flow along, but one thing I want to point out is Lesson 12 was all about surfaces, and so what you were kind of imagining is the net flow of a vector field in three-dimensional space across a surface. Might be an open surface, might be a closed surface. The classic picture is a closed surface, right? So you're imagining this surface sitting in three-dimensional space and you're thinking about the net flow of that of a three-dimensional vector field across that surface. Um, in this chapter we are going back to curves for the most part. So you are imagining in this case a closed curve sitting in three-dimensional space and the net flow of the vector field along that curve. Now that's kind of a convenient adjustment because I mean, trying to imagine flow along for a closed surface that's a little bit mind-boggling, um, but flow along for a curve sitting in a three a three-dimensional curve sitting in a three-dimensional vector field that's not so bad, right? Um, so let's go back and, and build this machinery from two dimensions and then lift it up into three dimensions and we'll see where we go from there. So guys, I'm going back in time again to lesson eight. And um, we had our main tool was the path integral, right? Here's a path integral from two dimensional space. This is from lesson eight. This is how we computed the net flow of a vector field along, in this case, an open curve. If we want to lift that up to three-dimensional space, it's really no big deal. Look at this, it's still the integral of field dot tangent. Sure, the vector field has an extra component inside of it. Sure, now our tangent vector um, has a z component, but it's really not that big of a deal. It's the, the path integral is the, the integral of field dot tangent. Um, 
Is there some funny stuff going on here with this unit tangent and DS thing? Sure. Um, I will tell you that you can largely kind of uh, gloss over that subtlety for now, and as you kind of learn the chapter a little bit better, if you wanted to understand why this starting formula has a unit tangent and a DS in it, um, I think you'll be ready for it more in a couple days. Um, and you're always welcome to email me, and I can give you a quick explanation about how DS turns into DT. Uh, it's, the same th it's the same way it happened in Lesson 8, so it's not that big of a deal, uh, but it's certainly something that I can unpack for you if you're interested. But for now, I think it makes sense to kind of forge ahead and just talk about um, really just some basic examples that will get us uh, kind of comfortable in this new three-dimensional setting. Uh, big idea, though, is when we compute this path integral, if we get a positive number, we know that the net flow of the vector field along that curve is with the direction of the parameterization of that curve. You could also say with the tangent vectors, right? And that is totally equivalent. Either one's acceptable. Um, if your path integral ends up computing to be a negative number, we would say the net flow of the vector field along that curve is against the direction of parameterization or against the tangent vectors. Um, and again, notice we are talking about curves here, not surfaces. This is a path integral uh, that is for a curve sitting in three-dimensional space. Look at how this is a single integral, which is kind of nice, actually. Um, what you're going to find is at least these basic calculations are, are almost equivalent to what we were doing in Lesson 8, with very, very little adjustment. So here's a parameterization of a curve in three-dimensional space, that blue thing. And here's a vector field. And we want to find the net flow of this vector field along this curve. Uh, these red things that you're looking at, those are tangent vectors. We want to figure out if the net flow of the vector field along this curve is with or against these red tangent vectors. Again, I would uh, skip mostly to the second step here. Don't worry really worry too much about unit tangent or DS at the moment. And if in a couple days that's bothering you, get in touch with me and I can show you how to use Pythagorean theorem and chain rule to turn that unit tangent DS into this whole DT thing. And notice how our tangent vectors are not unit tangent vectors once we have the DT formula. Again, I can help you unpack that. It's not, it's not that big of a deal. Um, but I will tell you that I did an original take of this video where I was explaining that. And I started to realize that um, it was like a, a five to seven minutes uh, kind of tangent to take, uh, tangent, you get it, um, um, a digression, a five to seven minute digression. And uh, it really didn't add to the video. It just kind of added fluff right at a critical moment when it's, it's more important to compute a simple example and get a simple answer and realize that this material is not that different than what you were doing in lesson eight, at least at the beginning right here. So I'm not going to unpack that right now. Get in touch with me in a couple days if you, if you want help unpacking that. Um, let's look at this basic machinery, though. We have field of x of t, y of t, z of t. So we take our vector field, and we plug in our x of t, y of t, and z of t into that formula. That's how we get this negative 4 cosine t, comma t, comma 2t. Um, we just take a first derivative of our x of t, y of t, z of t to get our tangent vector. Take that dot product integrate from 0 to 2 pi, and look at this, we get an unequivocally positive result there. We know that 16 pi plus 4 pi squared is, without a doubt, a positive quantity. So the net flow of the vector field along this open curve is with the direction of the tangent vectors that we see in that picture. Okay, uh, now let's talk closed curves, right? Just like in Lesson 8, um, open curves were usually pretty simple kind of just with or against the tangent vectors. And then once we started getting into closed curves, we had interesting things happening. Um, we have to really adjust to that in, uh, in three-dimensional space as well. Okay, so um, how do we do closed curves in two-dimensional space? How do we handle closed curves in lesson eight? Uh, one cool thing is when we're doing these path integrals, we can add a little circle on our integrals to indicate that we have a closed curve. That's always a good habit. Um, but what made closed curves special in three-dimensional space? We had this whole Gauss-Green theorem going on, and we had 
the rotation of the vector field, dm dx minus dm dy. Now, what's going to make this more complicated for three-dimensional space is uh, rotation is a lot easier to understand in a two-dimensional setting. There's really, really just one axis of rotation in two-dimensional space. Rotation is really easy to capture in a two-dimensional setting. In a three-dimensional setting, we have three possible axes of rotation, and I'll, I'll kind of expand on that in a minute, but to make Gauss-Green theorem work for rotation in three-dimensional space, uh, there's some major updates and some major subtleties to unpack to make that work. So um, at its core, rotation in three-dimensional space is going to be a lot more complicated than just adding a third term. Divergence going from two dimensions to three dimensions, easy. Rotation going from two dimensions to three dimensions, it's much more subtle, and you have to think about it a little bit more. That's kind of the, why this is the last chapter of the course and not the second to last chapter of the course. All right, so um, let's unpack some of these subtleties. So in two dimensional space, um, we needed a counterclockwise parameterization of our curve. Um, we're gonna kind of stick with some of those ideas but the idea of counterclockwise in three-dimensional space is kind of a problematic idea unless we really look into it a little bit more closely. What I mean by that is, look at this curve sitting in three-dimensional space. By the way, this, this closed curve is this blue boundary here. We have a surface, and our curve is the boundary of that surface. But anyway, look at these red tangent vectors. Are those going clockwise or counterclockwise? Um, if you look from above, you might give one answer. If you look from below, you might give a different answer. And so if you're standing on top of that surface, um, you would probably say counterclockwise. Um, but if you were standing below that surface, you would give a different answer. So um, the best way to kind of picture this is imagine that you are either like a scuba diver who can swim above or below the this, uh, this surface, or my preferred analogy, or my preferred example is to use Spider-Man. So if you're Spider-Man, you've got options. You can stick to the top of the surface, and now from Spider-Man's perspective, um, these tangent vectors are going counterclockwise. You can use the right-hand rule to kind of verify that. Uh, put your thumb facing up. And when your thumb is facing up, kind of curl your fingers of your right hand, and you're going to notice that your fingers are going with... It's kind of hard to draw. We'll see it better in a, um, a later slide once I have um, some clip art to show up here. But you can try the right hand rule here, and you can see that um, your fingers kind of curl with those red vectors. It's counterclockwise for Spider-Man. Um, but he's Spider-Man. He doesn't have to just stick to the top of the surface, he can stick to the bottom of that surface. And from his perspective now, those tangent vectors are clockwise. That's a problem, right? Um, luckily, the right-hand rule does fix this. Now, what is the right-hand rule? For us, the right-hand rule is simply a way for us to determine where counterclockwise is. Um, it, the, the right-hand rule is not going to tell us what the net flow of a vector field along a closed curve is. Um, it's going to allow us to interpret our results from those path integrals as clockwise or counterclockwise. So the right-hand rule gives us a way of, of saying clockwise or saying counterclockwise um, in a mathematically precise fashion. Uh, how do you do it? Well, you declare a top side of your surface. Typically, you'll plot a normal vector. And in your write-up, you'll say, hey, this normal vector that I plotted is going to be the top of the surface. And um, once I have this top of the surface, you kind of put your thumb in the direction of that normal vector. And when you put your thumb in the direction of that normal vector, um, then the right-hand rule tells us that um, our parameterization is counterclockwise relative to the right-hand rule and that top normal vector we declared. Now, maybe if you had picked a different normal vector, you would have said this is clockwise. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with student number one saying that this is counterclockwise relative to their normal vector, 
and student number two saying this is clockwise relative to their normal vector, uh, those, those differences are going to naturally happen. I would say that there is a bias in this course towards picking normal vectors um, that you would um, say that your parameterization is counterclockwise, but that's okay. Anyway, that's what we use right-hand rule for. Right-hand rule is a way of interpreting our scenario so that we can say clockwise or counterclockwise in a precise fashion. Um, we do have to be careful. There are surfaces out there that you can't really declare a top or a bottom. Um, I did put a demo into the folder for you guys that you're welcome to use the Wolfram uh, CDF player to look at. Um, this thing here is called a Mobius strip. And a Mobius strip is special because it doesn't have a top or a bottom. It only has one side to it. Um, if you were to imagine an ant walking around this Mobius strip, if it walked in a loop, it would walk along what you, would, you are currently perceiving as the top. And then it would continue to what you're perceiving as the bottom, and then back to the top again. Well, what do you call a surface where when you walk around it, you walk along the top and the quote-unquote bottom? Well, it doesn't have a top or a bottom. It only has one side to it. Um, and if you kind of drag the slider in the Mathematica demo that I made, you could really see that happen. Um, so a Mobius strip is a really famous example of a non-orientable surface. A surface that doesn't have a top or a bottom. Uh, it's, it's a classic math joke, by the way. Why did the chicken cross the Mobius strip? To get to the same side. It only has one side. There's no top, there's no bottom, there's only one side. Well, in this case, we're not going to be able to use the mathematical machinery of this course for something like a Mobius strip, because if we can't declare a top or a bottom, if we can't say what our top normal vector is, um, then we can't really say clockwise or counterclockwise, which means that this surface is out of reach of the material in this chapter. Stokes' theorem is not going to be able to touch. So Stokes' theorem does not work on this sort of surface. Now, um, don't expect this to put too much of a wrench in the works. Um, will you see a triad problem where you have to explain, oh, this is a Mobius strip, so we can't use Stokes' theorem on it? Sure. Um, but I don't think you should expect to be taken by surprise, right? I don't think you should expect, say, a quiz or a final exam question um, where you get some random parameterization, and then when you actually try to plot out that parameterization, it turns out to be a Mobius strip. Um, that's somewhat unrealistic. So the most likely scenario is they've already got the Mobius strip on the paper, and you just have to explain, oh, hey, this surface doesn't have a top or a bottom, can't use Stokes' theorem, and that would kind of be the end of it. So we do have to be careful of this sort of scenario. Um, so what have, we, what have we handled so far? Um, well, we had to figure out how to define clockwise or counterclockwise in three-dimensional space, and we pretty much did that. Our surface needs a top side, and then once we've declared a top side, typically by plotting a normal vector, um, we can use the right-hand rule to say uh, whether our curve is parameterized in the clockwise or counterclockwise direction, or if we do a path integral, um, now we can easily say whether the net flow of the vector field along our curve, our closed curve, is going to be clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, we also dealt with what if we can't designate a top side? And pretty much the answer is we're in trouble. We're not going to be able to do it. Um, and that's okay. That won't happen to us very often, but we do need to recognize there are certain surfaces that we're not going to be able to use the new machinery that we're building on. Um, and then finally, this we haven't done yet, but um, the last thing we have to deal with is how to generalize the rotation of the vector field to three-dimensional space. And our challenge is, in two-dimensional space, rotation is really easy to capture. There's only one plane of, of rotation. In three-dimensional space, because we have three coordinate axes, we have three planes of rotation, right? We've got rotation in the xy plane, we have rotation in the xz plane, we have rotation in the yz plane. There are three planes of rota rotation. We have to try to capture that 
uh, to generalize the rotation of a vector field in, in three-dimensional space. Here's the best way to picture this, guys. Um, I want you to imagine an airplane. Uh, I changed the slide up a little bit. I used to use um, an example with kayaking. I realized uh, people probably are more interested in airplanes than they are interested in uh, in kayaks. I was going through a kayaking phase when I had uh, made my original PowerPoint. Um, but anyway, now I've got uh, I've got airplanes in here. I just took this image from Wikipedia. You can find the same picture there. But think about all of the choices that an airplane pilot has to make. Uh, the reason that flying a plane is a lot more complicated than, say, driving a car is you have three dimensions worth of choices to make as an airplane pilot. Um, the yaw of the airplane, the XY rotation, the rotation that happens perpendicular to the Z axis. Um, this is important for the airplane getting from point A to point B correctly, right? If you're flying from Chicago to Los Angeles, um, you need the correct yaw that whole time so that you go from Chicago to Los Angeles instead of from Chicago to Orlando or something, right? Um, figuring out the correct bearing of your airplane depends on doing the right yaw. Um, if you want to make sure that you are uh, picking the correct altitude, you want to make sure that you have the correct pitch, right? Um, when it's takeoff, this pitch, this YZ rotation, is going to be angled such that the airplane is gaining altitude. When it's time to land, uh, you want to change your pitch. You want to change your YZ rotation so that the airplane lands successfully. And then during the flight, uh, they're changing the pitch all the time to avoid areas of turbulence, avoid storms, avoid other airplanes. Um, and then there's the roll. Um, when you are uh, taking off or landing, you might experience a little bit of roll, right? Some YZ rotation. Um, and you'd probably experience that as, as they're kind of circling around the airport waiting, waiting to land. Uh, sometimes you'll see like one wing lift up and the other wing go down. Um, that's the roll of that airplane as you're kind of circling around um, the airport uh, waiting, waiting for permission to land. Um, and then you especially see it with like fighter jets and stuff. They'll do some, some crazy cool stuff. If you've ever gone to the uh, Chicago Air and Water Show, um, you can see some cool stuff with roll that you would see more with like a fighter jet than you would with a commercial jet. Um, but long story short, we have three different planes of rotation. Um, rotation in three-dimensional three space is a vector quantity because we have to capture rotation on the XY plane. We have to capture the rotation on the YZ plane. We have to capture rotation in the XZ plane. Three different planes have to be captured. And so while divergence was really simple in three-dimensional space, we just added an extra term and it was a scalar. This is why lesson 12 was about flow across because divergence is a much simpler quantity in three-dimensional space. It remains a scalar just with one extra term. When we go up to three-dimensional space for rotation, we now have to capture three different planes of rotation. Rotation in three-dimensional space is a vector quantity, and now we're going to update the name, and we're going to call it curl, the curl of a vector field. The curl of a vector field is, look at this, it's three different terms that look like rotation. Now, look at this z coordinate right here of this, of this vector. Um, the z component of this vector, dn dx minus dm dy, that might be reminiscent of the rotation of the vector field. Um, and then when you look at these other terms, they also kind of look like variations on the rotation of a vector field. They are. Um, it's just rotation in the yz plane, rotation in the xz plane, rotation in the xy plane. Um, why does it go yz and then xz and then xy? Well, this is the x-coordinate of the vector, and rotation that is perpendicular to the x-axis is rotation in the yz plane. This is the y component of our vector. Um, what kind of rotation happens perpendicular to the y-axis? xz rotation. And then here's the z component of our vector. What kind of rotation is perpendicular to the z-axis? rotation in the xy plane. And that's why 
this looks like the rotation of the vector field because rotation in the xy plane is perpendicular to the z-axis, right? Now, let's look at the differential operator definition here of the curl of the vector field. We see a cross product. What is this? This is del cross f. We are taking the cross product of del and our vector field. That's in contrast to, let me go back a slide here real quick. That's in contrast to the divergence of the vector field. Let me switch over to my pen here. This was del dot f. Um, so interesting little idea here. When we're in uh, lesson 12 and we're talking about divergence, this is a dot product, the dot product of del and the vector field. Well, what does a dot product give you? It gives you a scalar. So the fact that this is a dot product means that it's a fundamentally simpler quantity um, than curl. So divergence in three-dimensional space, super simple. You just take a dot product and you get a scalar, this nice simple scalar quantity. In three-dimensional space, when we're trying to generalize rotation, when we try to define curl, this is a cross product. A cross product of two vectors returns yet another vector. So curl in three-dimensional space is a vector. Um, now, this cross product is something that you guys will need to be familiar computing. Uh, when you want to memorize the definition of curl, you kind of have two choices. You can either memorize this big, long formula, and that's fine, but there's lots of letters to mix up, right? You've got P's and N's and M's and P's and N's and M's and Y's and Z's and Z's and X's, and you kind of have to remember the order they go in. Um, I'm not great at that, to be honest. This is not really my forte, memorizing a big, long formula um, where I have a hard time seeing the rhyme or reason of the placement of those terms when I'm memorizing it, at least. Um, the rhyme and reason comes from the derivation of it. So I actually just memorize this, or really, I memorize del cross f. And then, you know, at the beginning of a quiz, you can just re-derive this formula. Um, that's really up to you. If you like computing 3 by 3 determinants, um, then just memorizing del cross f should be sufficient because then you can easily get to your cross, uh, your, your, uh, cross product formula, your curl of your vector field. Um, and if you don't like taking 3 by 3 determinants, then you can just memorize this long formula. Um, that's really kind of a personal choice that you guys can decide. Um, but I'm better at memorizing what's the math behind it than what's the formula. And if you're the opposite, that's okay. Um, and, you know, most people are probably somewhere between, right? Um, just to show you guys again, the x component of the curl of the vector field um, causes swirl in the yz plane because perpendicular to the x-axis is swirl in the yz plane. Um, the y component of curl causes swirl in the, or rotation in the xz plane because perpendicular to the y-axis is going to be rotation in the xz plane. Look at how we're using the right-hand rule here, right? We're aligning our thumb with the axis, and our fingers are telling us where that rotation is happening. And then the most familiar one is this z component of the curl because we can see here that perpendicular to the z-axis is swirl in the xy plane. Um, and that looks like the rotation of the vector field. It's the same formula. The z component of this curl is the same formula as lesson 8, the definition of the rotation. All right, so um, how do we use this new quantity curl um, to, to make calculations? Well, curl is a vector quantity. Um, in try it one, sometimes I'll have students say, oh, the curl is positive. Well, that is a nonsense statement. We can't say the curl is positive. Uh, and the reason is, curl is a vector. It's an x component, comma, y component, z component. Um, even if you were to compute the curl of a vector field and get 3, comma, 7, comma, 9, sometimes students would look at that and say, oh, look, um, since all three components are positive, the curl is positive. Well, no, vectors don't really work that way, right? A vector can't be positive or negative. Um, for example, look at this slight variation. 3, negative 1, 10. 
is that factor positive or negative? I don't know, because part, some of the components are positive, some of the components are negative. It's meaningless to say a vector is positive or negative. Um, so you can't say curl is greater than zero or curl is less than zero. That doesn't work. Um, greater than zero and less than zero are concepts that make sense for scalars, not for vectors. And since curl is a vector quantity, um, we need to make a slight modification here. What's our modification? Well, we get to, we get ourselves a scalar by taking a dot product. So what you do is you imagine a vector oriented in three-dimensional space. And then you ask yourself, um, you basically compare a vector v to your curl and you take that dot product and that dot product will tell you if the curl is with or against the vector that, you, that you've chosen. Um, so we take a dot product here. Is the curl of the vector field at some given point? Um, when you dot that with some given vector, do we get a positive answer or a negative answer? If this dot product is positive, then the vector field is delivering a counterclockwise swirl to the given vector v through the point that starts at the point x naught, y naught, z naught. If we take that dot product and we get a negative answer, then the vector field is delivering a clockwise swirl. And then if that dot product is zero, then the vector field is delivering no net swirl to the vector v starting at the point x naught, y naught, z naught. Now, this might sound really confusing. Honestly, it makes a good try a problem. And uh, in the triad problem, almost everything is a given. So they'll give you the point x naught, y naught, z naught. They'll give you the vector v. And your job is just to plug all of that into this formula, curl dot v, or curl of x naught, y naught, z naught dot v. And you just figure out if that dot product is positive or negative. So almost everything will be a given when you do this sort of problem. So it's not actually as scary as it looks. Um, let me give you an example. This is something that could make a great quiz question, a great try a problem, a great lit sheet question, whatever. Um, so here's some vector field. Here's some given unit vector. And in, here's some starting point in three-dimensional space. And we're supposed to interpret this expression. Curl evaluated at 1, 0, negative 1, dot v. So first, compute the curl of the vector field. Um, I kind of like doing this from... 3x3 three three determinant, um, and you get 3y squared minus 2z um, comma 2x. Now, could you just memorize that really long formula from the previous slide and just plug into that long formula? Sure. But like I said, I would much rather compute a 3x3 three three determinant each time um, rather than accidentally mix up a y and z in my equation and then end up with the wrong answer. Um, I like this 3x3 three three determinant formula because it's alphabetical. I j, k, x, y, z, and then you just plug in your vector field, and you take the 3x3 three three determinants that we see here. Um, so if you have forgotten how to take 3x3 three three determinants, that's something to kind of practice with again. Um, I like expansion by minors, and then I get my 3y squared minus 2z and 2x. Notice how this is a vector quantity. Curl is a vector quantity. Now I'm going to evaluate that vector at 1, 0, negative 1, and I get 0, 2, 2. Now, I'm not done. I can't say, oh, 0, 2, 2 is positive. Nope, vectors can't be positive or negative. This is a vector quantity. The only way to really get good use out of this vector is to get to a scalar. And so how do I get to a scalar? Well, they want to know, hey, um, what's the relationship between this curl vector and another given vector in three-dimensional space. So we're going to take the dot product between 0, 2, 2, and the other unit vector they gave us, and we get a positive quantity. What does that mean? Well, that means that the given vector v and the curl vector that I computed at a given point in space, um, that dot product is positive, which means that this curl vector is delivering a counterclockwise swirl to my vector v. Now, try it one will kind of give you some uh, graphical ways of interpreting this, and I think I think it should work out pretty nicely. So they'll make some pretty pictures uh, that are hard to draw by hand, but Mathematica can kind of do a lot of that work. You could plot the vector field, you could plot the vector v, and you could kind of try to imagine whether the vector field is delivering a uh, counterclockwise swirl or a clockwise swirl to the given vector. 
right? And then that kind of builds us up to Stokes' theorem. Um, Stokes' theorem now is going to kind of uh, take advantage of this idea of dot, taking the dot product of curl and another vector. So um, Stokes' theorem gives us two choices to compute the net flow of a vector field along a closed curve. We can do either do the path integral of field dot tangent, or we could do the surface integral of curl dot top unit normal. Um, now, I promised you guys this, this uh, chapter was about curves and not really focused on surfaces. And that's for the most part true. Our focus is what is the net flow of a vector field along a curve. But if we ever have a closed curve, the cool thing about a closed curve is you can imagine a surface inside of it. And so we have a, an, um, an interior surface and a boundary curve. And what Stokes' theorem allows us to do is we can either do the path integral along the boundary, or we could do the surface integral over the interior. And the other thing that's kind of cool, um, Stokes' theorem is a really flexible theorem because it turns out that for any curve, uh, any closed curve you can imagine in three-dimensional space, there are a lot of different surfaces out there that have that curve as its boundary. And so Stokes' theorem actually gives us lots of different options for computing uh, flow along using the surface integral over an interior surface. All right, so this is kind of our big capstone theorem. And uh, I will tell you guys that this lecture will you know, help uh, help you put Stokes' theorem into like a, a proper context, but also Stokes' theorem takes a little while to digest. So this is a chapter where you definitely want to make sure that you're reading um, the basics and tutorials, um, and you definitely want to just give yourself time um, to absorb what this theorem is saying. Um, but at its core, it's, it, it is just a three-dimensional version of gauss green right? It's a set of choices. You can either compute a path integral, or you could compute a surface integral um, over a surface R that has C as its boundary curve. Um, it's a set of choices for two different ways to do a problem. Now, uh, a lot of you guys are going to take higher level physics courses, more calculus courses, um, a differential equations course, whatever. You're going to move on to higher level math and science courses. And when you do, if you see Stokes' theorem uh, again, you might see it written a little bit differently. So here's Stokes' theorem using the traditional notation that you might see in like a regular Calc 3 book. Um, so instead of writing curl, you would write del cross f, no big deal there. Um, and then instead of writing uh, top unit normal, that sounds kind of confusing, right? Top unit normal there. Um, you would often just shorten that to n. Um, but yeah, not a big deal. We'll, we'll uh, unpack this theorem. I know there's a lot going on in this slide um, and the previous slide. Um, just bear with me here and we will unpack as much of this as humanly possible. Um, by the way, I want to show you guys that Stokes' theorem really is just a three-dimensional analog of our two-dimensional Gauss-Green theorem. So I want to sell you guys on the fact that, yes, Stokes' theorem looks a little bit intimidating right now, but it really is just a three-dimensional version of what we already know. Um, so let me take um, a vector field you might be familiar with from two-dimensional space. In two-dimensional space, we had m comma n, right? I could put that vector field in three-dimensional space by putting a comma zero on it. And then I can compute the curl of this now three-dimensional vector field by using the curl Formula that, we, the formula that we've learned. And uh, when you take this 3 by 3 determinant, because of this 0, you end up with a lot of stuff canceling out. And the curl of this now 3-dimensional vector field is 0, comma, 0, comma, rotation. Um, the other thing that I can do is, uh, so remember, uh, Gauss-Green theorem in 2-dimensional space, you needed a closed curve in 2D and you needed that curve parameterized in the counterclockwise direction, uh, we can embed this into three-dimensional space by thinking about, oh, um, okay, so our curve is on the xy-plane, and a, a top unit normal vector 
for a curve in the xy plane would be 0, 0, 1. Kind of imagine a curve sitting on the xy plane. Well, a normal vector to that would be just 0, 0, 1. So if I try to throw this now three-dimensional scenario through Stokes' theorem, wait a minute, okay, so this is just 0, 0, 0 rotation. This is just 0, 0, 1. If I take that dot product, oh my gosh, this scary-looking surface integral just reduces down to the double integral of the rotation because the 0, 0 rotation dotted with 0, 0, 1 just becomes the rotation of the vector field. Um, yeah, it turns out that um, Gauss-Green theorem is just a two-dimensional simplification of Stokes 3D theorem. All right, so let's do some stuff with Stokes theorem. Um, the more we practice with it, the more examples we compute, uh, probably the easier this material is going to become. All right, so here's a given vector field. And I am going to compute the curl of that vector field. And when I do that computation, you could either use this formula or you can run it through that 3 by 3 determinant. You get 0, 0, 0. Hmm. That's a good sign. We kind of like getting 0, 0, 0 for the curl of the vector field because watch what happens when I try to use Stokes' theorem. Okay, so I know that I want a path integral, an integral of field dot tangent for this blue curve and for this vector field. Um, well, I didn't even parameterize this blue curve, which is kind of a hint that I might have some sort of shortcut going on. So hmm, I don't have enough information to compute the integral of field dot tangent right away. But let me throw this into Stokes' theorem. I know that I have two choices. I can either, either do a, a path integral of field dot tangent, or Stokes says I could do a surface integral of curl dot top unit normal, and wait a minute, the curl of this vector field is 0, 0, 0. Now I have not even computed any normal vectors yet, but it doesn't really matter because the dot product of 0, 0, 0 with whatever our normal vectors would be is going to be 0, so that surface integral is going to be 0. Oh, the net flow of the vector field along this closed curve is zero. It doesn't really matter what closed curve it is. It'll work for any closed curve that's sitting inside of this 3D vector field. Now this should be reminiscent of something. This probably reminds you of gradient fields, right? The net flow of a gradient field along a closed curve is equal to zero. And in this case, we kind of had something like that happen too. Um, any closed curve is going to have this property. And in fact, you are correct. Uh, your hypothesis is correct. This is going to kind of lead us into a discussion of gradient fields that's coming up pretty soon. All right, so uh, what's the long story short with this whole Stokes theorem thing? Um, this is not a, um, a universal mathematical truth that I'm about to tell you, but this is a, a strategy. Um, if you look at Stokes theorem, it's a complicated theorem. Um, at the end of the day, when your Stokes theorem is a set of choices, right? You now have the choice of either doing your path integral as the integral of field dot tangent, so you can compute the net flow of a vector field along a closed curve just using a, a simple path integral, or you get the option of using the surface integral of curl dot top unit normal, which is actually a lot more complicated, right? Like in in a lot of situations. If you actually have to run the numbers, the left side is much easier than the right side when you're crunching numbers. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, let's unpack Stokes' theorem, the right side of Stokes' theorem, for an actual surface integral. You would have to parameterize your surface as x of st, y of st, z of st. Um, you would have to compute the curl of the vector field. You would have to plug your parameterization into the curl, you would have to compute a normal vector for your surface, and then you would have to run that all through your surface integral ds dt. That's, that's a lot of work. Um, and most of the time, it's going to turn out to be easier to just, just compute the path integral, the integral field dot tangent, where you're not even worrying about surfaces. Because uh, you guys could have done this in lesson eight. We actually could have had you computing 
um, path integrals for curves in 3D back in lesson eight. It wouldn't have been that hard to, to add that version of the formula. Um, on the other hand, Stokes' theorem here, the surface integral stuff gets pretty complicated. So in practice, Stokes' theorem is good for shortcuts, not so good for raw calculations. Now that's not like a universal truth, but um, in general, I typically use the left side of Stokes' theorem for calculations. When I actually have to crunch numbers, I like to crunch numbers with the right side of the equation. And then, or the left side of the equation, I crunch numbers with the left side of the equation. The right side of the equation, I like to use it for shortcuts. And what I mean by shortcuts are the sorts of problems where, like, oh, when curl is zero, 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 you know, we just saw the shortcut that happens there. Or if you take this dot product and you find out that this dot product is always positive or something. You know, if you get something that is always greater than zero or something like that, so that you know that the flow along has to be counterclockwise or something. Um, that's the general takeaway. Use the left side, the path integral, for your number crunching. Use the right side for your shortcuts. And in general, that'll be a pretty good approach. Now, is, is it always possible that you'll be asked to compute a surface integral? Sure. I'm not saying that this is out of the realm of possibility. It's just that you want to avoid that whenever you can, right? Like as, as many times as you can avoid the right side of Stokes' theorem for number crunching, the better you're going to feel about all of this. Especially considering that the normal and the curl both involve taking cross products, right? Your normal vector is the same as what we had last chapter, so it's a cross product of two tangent vectors. Uh, the curl of the vector field is... Uh, del cross F, it's, it's also a cross product. So we're taking a dot product of two cross products. Yeah, it just gets pretty messy, right? So if we can avoid that mess, we like to avoid that mess. All right, finally, let's talk gradient vectors. Um, so we had some pretty cool properties of gradient vectors from, uh, from earlier lessons. And we want to, in fact, this goes all the way back to lesson four. Uh, let's lift that up to three dimensional space. So first of all, the definition of the gradient vector has not changed. It's del times f. So it's this differential, this vector of differential operators here times our function f. That's the gradient of f. Uh, the gradient vector is going to point in the direction of greatest initial increase in our vector field. Um, and yeah, or on our, on our function. Um, so not, not too big of a deal there, right? Uh, when we were talking about the earlier material, we kind of imagined that uh, our vectors are pointing in the direction of greatest initial increase on a surface F. Um, so we can kind of use those, uh, those gradient vectors to go uphill. Um, the direction of greatest initial altitude increase on a surface F. Um, it does get a little bit messier when we're talking about three-dimensional space because now you know, technically, f of x, y, z would be a um, would be a four-dimensional hypersurface. Eh, we don't really want to try to imagine four-dimensional hypersurfaces. Instead, still imagine that you're in three-dimensional space and think of f of x, y, z as a temperature function. And our gradient vectors are going to point in the direction of greatest initial temperature increase. So you kind of imagine you're like swimming or you're scuba diving or something, and you're in the water and you're swimming around in f of x, y, z describes the temperature at any given location in three-dimensional space. And when you're following your gradient vectors, you're going in, in the direction of greatest initial, initial temperature increase. And so the, the water temperature is going up or down as you're swimming. And if you follow the gradient vectors, um, that temperature is going to increase as much as possible. Um, you know, you could use Mathematica. Uh, it, has like, it has a fine maximum and a fine minimum uh, feature. And so you could find little hot spots and little cold spots and stuff that way. Um, in general, you do have to be careful with find maximum in Mathematica. I know there's a triad problem coming up um, where find maximum will kind of um, send you in the wrong direction because, um, literally send you in the wrong direction because there's gonna be like infinitely many little maximums. And so find maximum in Mathematica is nice for you know identifying a single hot spot or cold spot. 
Um, be careful using that too much in your triad problems because you might run into some issues. Um, but in general, this is what to picture uh, when we're talking about um, gradient vectors for a function of three variables, f of x, y, z. All right, so we had a gradient test back in lesson seven, and really it was just if the rotation of the vector field is equal to zero, and we don't have any singularities to worry about, then um, we can say that our vector field is a gradient field. Uh, we want a gradient test for three-dimensional space as well. If the curl of a vector field is zero, 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 we are going to say that we, and, and if we don't have any singularities to worry about, we are going to say that we have a gradient field. Um, so basically, if the rotation in the uh, yz plane, the rotation in the xz plane, and the rotation in the xy plane, each of the, if each of those are zero, and we don't have any singularities to worry about, um, then we say that we have a gradient field. Um, so that, that's kind of the crux of it. Now, be really careful. Um, a lot of students, when they first start this chapter, they like to write, oh, the curl is zero. Um, so we have a gradient field. Well, that doesn't make sense, because curl is a vector quantity. It's if the curl of the vector field is equal to the zero vector. So theoretically, you could say that the curl of the vector field equals the zero vector, put a little vector hat on that, and, and that would theoretically work. Um, even that is dangerous, though, because if you forget the hat, or you forget the hat means zero, 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 then you end up in trouble. So we want to just say if the curl of the vector field is equal to the zero vector, um, and if we have no singularities, we have a gradient field. Um, proving this is not so bad. Uh, we've done similar stuff before. Um, but if we have a function f of x, y, z, um, and if we compute the gradient of that, uh, of that function f, um, that's going to be 0, 0, 0. Uh, and you can just run it through this and see. So yeah, basically if we have a function f and we want to show that the, um, that the gradient is 0, 0, 0, or I'm sorry, the gradient has a curl of zero, zero, zero. Just compute this, and you're going to get zero, zero, zero from that. So that's that's how you can prove, in, at least in one direction, that uh, when you have a gradient field, the curl is zero, zero, zero. Um, let's talk closed curves. Uh, this is the same thing that happens uh, from our f of x, y case, our, our lesson seven case. So um, the net flow of a gradient field along a closed curve is going to be equal zero. Um, now we can't really do the hiking trail analogy. Remember we said like, oh, if, we're, if we start at base camp and we hike a loop around the mountain and we come back to base camp, what is our net change in altitude? Well, it's uh, the net change in altitude is zero. The net flow of a gradient field along a closed curve is zero. Uh, when we lifted up the three dimensions, now we, we can't really think about like altitude and stuff, but it, even temperature, right? Um, if you start at your house and you're, you're running the air conditioning so that your house is always at a perfect 72 degrees Fahrenheit, and you start at your house, and then you decide to go for a walk around town, um, a socially distant walk, and you take a walk around, and then you eventually come back to your house, and it's nice and temperature controlled. Well, what is the net change in temperature? Well, your house started at 72 degrees. You might have gone outside, and it might have gone as high as 80 degrees, Maybe you were by Lake Michigan for a little while, and it went down to 71 degrees, and then um, maybe it got really hot as you were walking, 80, or maybe it was hot over here, 81 degrees. But then when you get back to your house, what is the net change in temperature you experience? Well, the net change in temperature is zero degrees, because it started at 72, ended at 72, your net change in temperature was zero. That's a way of kind of imagining it. Um, but basically, what you have to remember is, the net flow of a gradient field along a simple closed curve in three-dimensional space is zero. It's the same thing as before. And again, you could uh, easily kind of prove this. Uh, the proof, this is a nice proof to be able to, to do yourself, especially in triad problems around the final. Uh, it's Stokes theorem. So if your vector field is a gradient field, you already know that the curl of that vector field is zero, zero, zero. You can verify that on the previous slide just by computing a three by three determinant. But anyway, uh, when you invoke Stokes' theorem, which is our best tool for little shortcuts like this, 
you say, okay, our path integral of field dot tangent is going to equal the surface integral of curl dot top unit normal. You don't even have to worry about what this top unit normal would be because when you plug in 0, 0, 0 for the curl, when you take that dot product, you get the surface integral of 0, which, is, which means that the net flow of that vector field along that closed curve is 0. And we've kind of proven that quantity, right, or proven that, that property. Uh, you guys should also be able to prove this, this property. That's a good thing to know how to do. Um, let's see. So this right here is the same example I just gave you. Just think about temperatures. Um, you know, and then you want to think about a system that's in, in a steady state. That's why I picked your house that's perfectly air conditioned at 72 degrees. You're imagining that, um, that you're in a steady state system for temperature. But um, if you start and end at the same point, your net change in temperature is zero because your house started at 72 degrees. You took your hike, came back to your house, still at 72 degrees. Net change in temperature is zero. Um, remember, this is only true for gradient fields, so you can kind of imagine a, a final quiz for this course um, having a shortcut problem where you have a closed curve, and then you compute the curl of your vector field, you get 0, 0, 0, and then you know you have a shortcut, that the net flow of a gradient field along that closed curve is 0. Um, the important part being that you have a gradient field. Please don't try to apply this property to any old vector field, only gradient fields. Uh, path independence also works, right? Um, so if you have C1 and C2 that are different curves but share the same starting and ending point, the net flow of the vector field along C1 is going to be the same as the net flow of the vector field along C2. Um, and again, this is a good thing to know how to prove. Uh, we did a try a problem like this back in the day. Um, but what you do is you take C1 and C2, join them into a closed curve, then you know the net flow of the gradient field along this new, brand new closed curve that we made is zero, and then you split them back apart. The flow along C1 minus the flow along C2 is going to equal zero, and then the flow along C1 is going to equal the flow along C2 path independence. And so you guys can use this property in your triad problems. Um, you can use path independence for some, uh, some really clever applications. The net flow of a gradient field along any two curves that start and end at the same point is the same. All right, guys, and that is all I've got for you. Thanks so much for tuning in, and uh, I hope you enjoy your last uh, lecture of this course. Uh, you guys have done it. You have learned a lot of uh, vector calculus in this, uh, in this class, and uh, this is the capstone theorem of the course. Stokes' theorem is the big theorem, and you have now learned it. Um, you will get much better with Stokes' theorem the more you practice with it. So good luck on those triads. Make sure you read the basics and tutorial, and you guys are going to do great. Thank you.